CityCast from Explicity. They arrested him on the morning of 18th August. George Idalji had been on his way to work as usual, wearing a light three-piece check suit and a smart straw boater. He was waiting to catch the 845 train to Birmingham when a local police constable came up to him and said he was wanted at Cannock Police Station. Inspector Campbell had asked to see them. He asked what it was about. The policeman said he did not know. Somewhere on the platform, George heard a man say that a horse had been killed. He told the constable that he had important work in his office and would call on the inspector later. The constable asked him if he could not take a holiday for a day. He shook his head and turned his face away. Later, they said he had been smiling. He said he had smiled at something else. That morning, the police called at his house in the village of Worley and interviewed his father, the Reverend Shapurji Adalji, and his mother, Charlotte. They removed a coat, a waistcoat, and a pair of shoes. Then they called at George's office in Birmingham. The coat had bloodstains, they told him. The shoes were muddy. Could he see the coat, he asked. No, they said. They had left it at the police station as they could not carry it so far. They described the coat, asked him if he had worn it the night before. He said he had not. It was an old coat that he used only in the house and in the grounds. They told him they had found horse hairs on it. He said he may have picked them up while leaning on a fence. Soon after, they arrested him on the charge of mutilating and killing a horse in Great Worley in fields half a mile from the vicarage. He denied the charge, saying he had not left the house that night. By afternoon, he was in a cold, white tiled cell in the lockup in Steelhouse Lane, where members of the notorious Birmingham gang, the Peaky Blinders, would soon be imprisoned. He, George Edward Thompson Edalji, 28, a solicitor of New Hall Street, Birmingham, the son of an Indian vicar and an English mother, was a prisoner of His Majesty's government. Not too many years ago in New York City, I went to watch a movie that anyone intelligent was talking about, Victoria and Abdul. It is the story of how Abdul Karim, a servant of Queen Victoria, the Queen of England at the time, came to become her closest confidant. It's a touching tale. After the movie, in the uh, theater's foyer, I overheard one woman asking her friend in a most puzzled tone, is that what that museum in London is called, Victoria and Abdul? No, dear, her friend replied, and set her straight on the correct name. It's Victoria and Albert Museum, dear. The title of the movie is based on the book of the same name by my guest today, author, journalist, and historian Shrabni Basu. Shrabni has the almost uncanny ability to find a story where others did not, and then spend years researching and writing it such as the story about a Parsi lawyer in pre-World War I England, George Idalji, who was accused and convicted of murdering horses. Now, all of us at some point have lived in 221 Baker Street in our hearts and minds. It's where Sherlock Holmes lived. We know that Arthur Conan Doyle created Sherlock Holmes and wrote those magnificent mysteries, but not many of us know that there were only two occasions when Conan Doyle could actually play Sherlock Holmes. One was that of Oscar Slater, who was a gambling den operator who was convicted of bludgeoning an 82-year-old woman. Conan Doyle's curiosity was piqued because of inconsistencies that he found in the case. He wound up paying for most of Slater's successful appeal 20 years later. The earlier and more famous case was that of George Idalji. Now, when he was in prison, Idalji read a lot of Sherlock Holmes' mysteries, and then when he was released ahead of time, he wanted his name cleared, so he wrote to Arthur Conan Doyle and asked for help. 
Conan Doyle got involved, and despite the efforts of the local constabulary, had him exonerated. Shrabani Basu's book, The Mystery of the Parsi Lawyer, is a book that not only clears George Idulji's name in public and historical opinion, but it is a cannot-put-down thriller, more so because it's a real-life Sherlock Holmes thriller. And now back to the lovebirds Victoria and Abdul, and setting aside my pretensions of not being interested in muckrake and scuttlebutt, I'd like to know how close Victoria was to Abdul. I mean, how close, really? To that end, let's ask the author. Shrabani Basu, welcome to the literary city. Well, it's lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Ramji. <laughs> Entirely my pleasure. Right, now Victoria and Abdul. Now, that would be a rather unlikely name for a law firm, wouldn't it? <laughs> it uh, well, it was a little cheeky twist on Victoria and Albert Museum, so which is always written as VNA, and, uh, you know, well. That's <laughs> funny. All right, now let's not waste any more time, and let's get straight to the hot goss. Victoria and Abdul, did they or didn't they? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean... Well, of course, you know, I wasn't there under the bed, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible that they would have because that's not the, that's not the relationship. The relationship is multi-layered is the way I see it. It's, um, and this is through the letters and, you know, what I see from their interactions. Sometimes she signs a letter, your loving mother. Sometimes it's your close friend. Sometimes it's just VRI and then all written in Urdu with, um, you know, crosses for kisses. So it's going between, you know, a friend, a confidant, sometimes a son. And um, Victoria is quite interesting because when Albert dies, you know, her beloved husband, she writes in her journals that she feels she has lost a husband, a friend, uh, a father, and even a mother. So, you know, that's how complicated and complex relationships can be. And I think this was one of those complicated and, uh, you know, multi-layered relationships. Um, but there was a physical element, you know, there were two men who came and one was, <laughs> she describes Muhammad Baksh as short and smiling. And she describes Abdul Karim as fine with a fair countenance, you know, immediately he's the one. <laughs> now you found out about Abdul Karim when you were mm -hmm. researching a book on Indian curries. Mm -hmm. You were a good cook. <laughs> Oh, sort of <laughs> possible. I enjoy cooking. I enjoy feeding friends, <laughs> trying new things. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so how did you find Abdul Karim? So uh, the curry book is a history of curry. As a historian, I wanted to research, uh, you know, going back to the East India Company when they went searching for spices. So it looks at it over, you know, over centuries. And I knew that Queen Victoria uh, uh, loved her curries and that she had two Indian servants who cooked them for her. Mm -hmm. And that's all I knew when I went to Osborne House and uh, saw these portraits of, you know, this man, <laughs> Abdul Karim, painted in red and gold. And, you know, the photographs are in the book and uh, he's holding a book. And it struck me that he doesn't look like a servant. Mm. Uh, he's been painted like a Nawab, like a nobleman. Cool. Uh, and then I saw more of his photographs, uh, more of his, uh, you know, portraits, busts. And then the clincher was when I went to Queen Victoria's bedroom. And so above her bed, and the bedroom has been left, and this is in Osborne House where she died. Right. The bedroom has been left exactly as it was when she uh, when she died there. So when she died, I mean, her bed has a photograph of her favorite, uh, Albert, above her bed. And there is a dressing area, which is sort of adjacent to the bedroom. And there near her dressing table were two photographs. So the top one was John Brown. Oh, yes. He was a Scottish yes. ghillie with whom she had a relationship. He brought her out of mourning. Right. And below John Brown was Abdul Karim. Okay. You know, sitting, looking very dapper. And I said, okay, I need to know more about this guy. And that's really how it started. <laughs> how does it work? Do you simply show up at Windsor Castle one day, knock on the door and say, may I see your secrets, please? No, of course not. You have to write to the archivist. I had to prove that I wasn't just a, you know. I mean, I, I wrote in my letter. I'd already done a book by then. Uh, I'd written Spy Princess about Nuri Nayat Khan. So, you know, I ticked the box with a very respectable book. I wasn't a sleazy, you know, sun tabloid reporter. Um, well, they allowed me They allowed me in. You know, that was not a problem. I wanted to see. I was very clear that I'm researching this relation. 
and I'd like to see Queen Victoria's journals. And importantly, I wanted to see Queen Victoria's Hindustani journals. So I thought that there'd be one or two phrase books, you know, with everyday words or something like that. And the archivist wheeled in a trolley with 13 volumes. And she had one for every year that they were together. She never missed a lesson. Each one was a record of their year. So literally in these pages was their personal space. And no Western biographer had ever looked at them. So the blotting paper fell out, you know, 100 years later, there were some in Urdu, but these are lessons. So they are then translated in English. They are written in Roman so I could read it. And I, you know, I've grown up in Delhi. I follow Hindi. So Urdu and Hindi, I can understand. And um, it was brilliant. It was just a treasure trove. (laughs) Must have been a challenge to research that story, especially when most of the evidence had been set on fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I started out and I, you know, the first thing I learned was that all the letters are written by Queen Victoria to Abdul Karim, and she would write about five letters a day. I'm not joking. I've seen some of the letters which survived. Uh, they were in Windsor Castle, and I saw them. Uh, some of them, as I said, were signed with crosses for hearts. Some just said, just come and say good night to me. He lives you know, down the road. Just She just asked him to come and say good night to her. Some were really showed how deeply person, you know, their relationship was pretty intimate. And uh, well, of course, I started out, I knew that these letters have been burned. So, uh, you know, a major source has gone. Uh, But that's why I then said, okay, next stop, go to the top, go see her journals and work out, you know, work it out from there and see. I mean, there are lots of other sources in the book, including uh, those who are outside this relationship. So the household, you know, all the nasty bits, (laughs) plus the newspapers. You know, I'm a journalist. I know there's going to be stuff. I wanted to see how they are reporting uh, Abdul Karim. They call him the Brown, John Brown in their gossip columns. So I had to put it all together from various sources. Um, Took four years. (laughs) Oh, I believe it. After Victoria dies, the son and the palace panjandrums jump in and try to erase every record and memory of Abdul Karim. But didn't Victoria secure this man while she was still alive? Or did she? Well, she did secure him. She got him a large grant in Agra. Okay. She knew that there would come a land grant in Agra. So actually, Abdul Karim had become part of the landed gentry of Agra. His father, who was just an apothecary in, you know, in the jail... Uh, was given the title of uh, Khan Bahadur, which is, you know, the equivalent of a knighthood. (laughs) So he was rubbing shoulders. He was invited to the Viceroy's Darbar. He was rubbing shoulders with the nobility. But she could not control what her son Bertie did after that, you know, enter his house and uh, destroy the letters. So that was, but she provided for him financially. Um, So he didn't, he wasn't poor, you know, when he went back. So he didn't die broke. No, no, I think he just died heartbroken. (laughs) Not merely a passing fancy then. She really cared for him. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. She stuck up for him. She got so many brownie points from me because of the way she takes on her household and uh, her son. Yeah, yeah. Memos from her. Yeah. She was amazing in that sense. (laughs) And now to the mystery of the Parsi lawyer. Did you specifically connect the creation of the appeals court in England to uh, the outcome of the Adalji case? Absolutely, because in 1907, when you know he, this whole saga comes up and Arthur Conan Doyle then, uh, enters this, you know, takes champions his cause, um, there are meetings before that. Uh, George Adalji is left, you know, sort of released from jail and there are meetings calling for um, uh, an appeal court to be set up because this is exactly what campaigners were looking for. So the fact that in 1907, after, you know, he is given his free pardon, uh, this appeals court is set up. I mean, there's a direct link. <laughs> Did you write this book during the pandemic? <laughs> no. I, it took five years to write this book, actually. I started in 2015. Uh, so luckily, I had finished all my research. Because, again, the, you know, I do quite a bit of research, as you know, is obvious. Um, so it took me to four libraries and finally finished trawling through all the police files uh, in Portsmouth, his letters, uh, everything that could be done. Plus, you know, as a journalist myself, I have to go to the scene of crime. <laughs> I have to check out the place, you know, get the atmosphere of the place. So all that took a long time because politically there was a lot going on in Britain at the time, Brexit, non-stop elections, et cetera. So I had to, this is with a few pauses. 
but I finished my research just before the library is shut. So that was really lucky. By December of 2019, I had done my research. So I could have the first draft and then in, you know, then everything shut. So the I wouldn't have been able to complete it. Um, I had my research work. I was just doing the edits after that um, for, for a year. Yeah. To discuss prose for a minute, the second sentence of your prologue reads, It was a wild and windy night. Tell me honestly, did it take a lot of resolve not to write Dark and Stormy Night? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I didn't start a ghost story with it was a wild night. It actually was. Uh, so George Adalji writes that it was a wild night. Arthur Conan Doyle brings it up, that he couldn't have crossed these fields because it was stormy night. Um, the fact that his boots are wet is because it has been raining. He stepped into puddles. So there's a lot of reference to this wild and windy night. Uh, it wasn't made up. <laughs> it could have been a clear August night with a full moon. <laughs> it is true. It is. And I should have put it in quotes. <laughs> and now speaking of things that are darker than stormy nights, your descriptions of the racism that the Idalgis had to face back at the time were palpable, almost like you felt it. I was looking at this and, you know, I was, as I write in my book as well, that I was doing the final edits and writing this, uh, you know, in lockdown when uh, Black Lives Matter just exploded around the world. And uh, so it just made everything so relevant. I was looking at cases in the UK at the time. Who was getting stopped and searched when we had a pandemic? Most of all, who was being put behind bars? Uh, it was always the Black people, you know, Black nation, always. Um, a black MP was searched. You know, she's driving a Mercedes in East London. They said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm an MP. So this is the sort of thing that was happening during lockdown. And, you you know, you realize how relevant this happened. You know, my joy, the story happened 100 years ago. But the fact that it's still going on, uh, the fact that the police are, you know, always charged with institutional racism, it comes up over and over again. So there's no escaping that. Um, and, well, you take it in your stride because, you know, you write about it. As a writer, you've just got to put it out there. And this is happening. With so much hate mail, graffiti, poop in a bag, why didn't the Idalgis just pack up and move to someplace a little less mm -hmm. racist mm -hmm. in England? Mm -hmm. Well, that's really interesting. And to me, that is the immigrant experience. So what... What happened? The first thing that happens is graffiti painted outside the vicarage saying Idalgis are wicked. What does Shapurji Idalji do? He he wipes it off. What did all these shopkeepers, you know, we know of all the Asian corner shop owners in the 60s, in the 70s, they had these little corner shops. They were attacked. Their windows were broken. It's happening less and less now. But in the 60s, in the 70s, this happened yeah. a lot. What did they do? They just went and they mended that window and they got on with their lives. And that is exactly, to me, this is the immigrant experience that Shapuji Adalji, you know, went through. Um, you know, I've talked about curries in that book that I wrote. It's about, um, you know, the Bangladeshis were the ones who started all these high street curry houses. And what did they face? They had their heads bashed in, you know, serving this late night curry to a lot of drunken yobs. Um, what did they do? Did they give up and go away? No, they just went through, you know, went with it. They laid the foundations of this industry. I mean, they served dreadful food, but the point is that they had, they put it there, you know, it catered to the English palate, whatever it did, it was there. And so they play a sort of important role in the social history of the time. Um, and I see Shapuji as just the same, same story, same immigrant experience, except he, he had a fight in him. He, he did take it up. He had a petition, you know, signed. Uh, and George fought as well. <laughs> George was incredible. <laughs> and now, towards the end of the book, you are in this graveyard with your niece hunting for George Idalji's tomb. And it's hot and you're just about giving up on the task when you chance upon it hidden under some bramble. In my mind's eye, it has you dropping to the ground and weeping with relief. <laughs> But that's not what you did. No, it was sheer joy. I wasn't crying. I was at high fiving with my niece because she was saying, "Let's go. This is the, we can't find this grave." And I said, "Okay, one more, one more." And then there was this last grave. It was, you know, virtually sunk into the ground and it was covered with weeds. So there's nothing. So I have a photograph in my book of the bit that I pulled off, and you can see the rest is still covered. And I said, okay, last one. And then suddenly this name emerged, you know, Thompson and my hopes rose and then Edward. And 
you know, I knew his full name was George Edward Thompson Edalji and then George at the end and Edalji on the other side. And then it was like, whoopee, <laughs> we got that. <laughs> yeah, in this empty, empty graveyard, you know, both of us just shrieking with delight. You know, there were no tears. I wasn't sobbing. <laughs> very appropriate behavior in a graveyard. <laughs> Not for, if anybody had seen a sort of, you know, middle-aged Asian woman shrieking with joy in a graveyard, they would have thought I was cuckoo, but uh, I probably was. <laughs> they would have probably said, oh, she didn't like him much. <laughs> for our listeners, there's a link in the podcast description on where you can buy The Mystery of the Parsi Lawyer. Another book of yours I'd like to touch upon briefly, Spy Princess, about Noor Inayat Khan the woman who spied for Britain during the Second World War and was a telegraph operator under the most difficult and dangerous circumstances. This was turned into a movie, right, on Amazon Prime. I think it was called uh, A Call to Spy. And But she was just a character in that movie. She's a character in that, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> That's right, yeah, yeah. Once again, a fascinating book about a fascinating woman, but... You got involved with her life in a much deeper way. You became a crusader for her. And you were instrumental in getting a statue of hers erected in London? A stamp, a memorial, and a blue block. So three things. <laughs> I had a long wish list. <laughs> yeah, so I took them all off. Um, and actually, the memorial, the idea for a memorial, I'd just written a book. And I had promised her brother that, you know, I would do everything to make sure that her story was told. Um and uh, so after the book was out, um, you know, I, I, I thought it would be by, you know, spreading the knowledge about Noor and doing talks, etc. But my readers wrote to me, I had several readers who said, why isn't there a memorial for her? We love the book. Thank you for bringing our story out. And they, uh, you know, there was a gentleman who said she should be on the fourth plinth. You know, we have a fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square, which has a constantly moving sculpture. So every six months it's changed. She should be on the fourth plinth. I will write to the prime minister every day. And I was saying, my good God, people have really taken her story to heart and they're very serious. And then I said, well, you know, who's going to do this memorial? It has to be me. And thus you got into it. Do you get passionate and deeply involved with everybody that you write oh. about? Uh, not all of them. <laughs> I mean, yes, uh, Noorin Al Khan obviously is my heroine. That's, that's you know, blatantly obvious for anyone to see because I have championed her cause. I wrote the book so many years, it's nearly 20 years, and I still talk about her, you know, write about her and um, keep keep at it. And in fact, the blue plaque was unveiled in 2020. So in the middle of the lockdown, and they asked me, English Heritage asked me to um, unveil it. So it was quite an honor. Indeed, it's no trivial thing at all. So, Shrabani, what's next? I mean, I'm tinkering with various things that I want to do. There's always leads that I want to follow, uh, but we'll see. A few leads to follow. You sound like you have quite a few stories to tell. I think there are so many stories to tell. Well, whenever it is that your next project is released, I'm sure it's worth the wait. <laughs> That's very kind of you. <laughs> Might be a few years. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe I should write a quickie. Sometimes I feel I should do a quickie. There are people who write books every year. How do they do that? <laughs> Neither the faintest nor the foggiest. But this was fun. Shrabani Basu, thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. Thank you. It was lovely to be here and chat. <laughs> Take care. And that was journalist, historian and compelling author Shrabni Basu coming to us from her home in London. And I'll be back with What's That Word? And I'm back with What's That Word? Where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time but never stop to think about. And to help me with it is my co-host. And as always, I will let her introduce herself. Take it away. Hi, my name is Pranati, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. Hello again, P with an A. How's it going? Hey, did you read Sherlock Holmes growing up? Yes, of course I did. Everyone I knew did. What about you? Did you read Sherlock Holmes? Some abridged version as a kid. Huh. And how would you describe Sherlock Holmes in one word? Arrogant. Arrogant? Why so? Ah, I have a thing for the under underdog, so I like Watson. Holmes takes all the glory. But Holmes was the brilliant one. He's the one who solved all the mysteries. Watson was around. I give Watson more credit. <laughs> now that would be the mystery of the misplaced encomium. <laughs> I think it's a guy thing. Me? 
I feel for the guy who probably felt left out. Ah, you're kidding. Okay. All right, but you might be right about the guy thing, because Sherlock Holmes was in some ways our first James Bond. But as we grew older, we developed more pretensions towards literature and a deeper understanding of... Opium addiction. <laughs> okay, you win. I think the generation before us millennials would have known Arthur Conan Doyle better. But it's appropriate we're talking about him now. And why is that? His birthday was four days ago, May 22nd. Oh, right. You had posted that on the Bangalore Literary Society Facebook group. Cool. Okay, P with an A, what's that word? In your interview with Shrabani Basu, and I totally loved the book, Victoria and Abdul, by the way. Great book. Yeah, and that story of the women in the theatre foyer was hilarious. <laughs> I was walking right next to them and had to pretend that I hadn't overheard. <laughs> okay. In your interview, you said panjandrum for the palace officials. Yeah, panjandrum. So that's our word? All right, let's start. What do you know of the meaning? Um, a, a powerful person or official, but the word is not used admiringly. No, it isn't. It is used to describe an official, but in the manner of being officious, you know, a self-important grandee, pretentious. Right. And does this word have any real etymological roots? The pan part sounds Latin. Yes, it does. But no, no Latin, no Greek roots. It's in fact a nonsense word coined by a famous British actor, Samuel Foote, in 1755. Really? In which book? Not a book. In fact, it's from an anecdote, a really funny one. Let's hear it. Okay, so in 1753, a very famous stage actor in London called Charles Macklin, he lived to be 100, by the way, started a show in Covent Garden mm. and called it British Inquisition. Every evening at seven, he would deliver a lecture and it was followed by a debate. How interesting. So interesting that it attracted the attention of a fellow actor, Samuel Foote. Now, Foote was a master mimic and a great wit, and he decided to heckle Macklin rather mercilessly. <laughs> what fun. But why? Well, the problem was that while Macklin's show was popular, Macklin himself, during a lecture on memory, was unwise enough to boast that his own memory was so sharp and so well-trained that he could remember any lines after hearing them only once. Could he? No idea. But Samuel Foote, upon hearing the boast, decided to challenge Macklin by composing a passage that included complete nonsense made-up words that would make it hard for Macklin to remember. <laughs> That's evil. What were the lines? Delightful stuff if you like nonsense. Well, here goes. So, she went into the garden to cut a cabbage leaf to make apple pie. And at the same time, a great she-bear coming up the street pops its head into the shop. What? No soap? So he died. And she very imprudently married the barber. And there were present the Piccaninnies and the Jobbilillies and the Garyolies and the Grand Panjandrum himself with a little brown button on top. And they all fell to playing the game of catch as catch can till the gunpowder ran out at the heels of their boots. Oh, gosh, what rubbish. <laughs> So did Macklin remember them? Did he um, stand up to the challenge? No. Apparently Macklin was so indignant about this nonsense heckling that he refused to repeat a word of it. <laughs> I don't blame him. And so how did panjandrum stick in usage since then? Well, the word panjandrum became widely known much later, something like in 1825, and it appeared in a novel in which it was quoted as a test of memory and attributed to Samuel Foote. Now, panjandrum was already well known by then, but etymologists have not been able to find any earlier usage before the novel. Right. There were other nonsense words in that passage. <laughs> Piccaninnies, jobbilillies. But only Grand Panjandrum survived. Maybe because Grand Panjandrum has a nice cadence 
and an internal rhyme. And anyway, later it got shortened to just Panjandrum. Oh, and there's a World War II reference to the word. You mean uh, pretentious army officers? That would be likely, but no, not at all. You know those huge circular things they use these days to lay down cables on the side of the street? You know, the cables are wound round a drum in the middle? Oh, yeah, I've seen those. They roll them down the street. They're massive. Right. But that gizmo was first developed as a weapon by the British. And uh, I assume that they packed it with ordnance and rolled it at the enemy. Did it win battles? <laughs> no, apparently it was a miserable flop. <laughs> Maybe because they called it a panjandrum. <laughs> the Germans probably died laughing at it. <laughs> well, I cannot stop laughing. Do those lines again. Anything for a giggle. <clears throat> So, she went into the garden to cut a cabbage leaf to make an apple pie. And at the same time, a great she-bear coming up the street pops its head into the shop. What? No soap? So he died. And she very imprudently married the barber. And there were present the piccaninnies and the jobbalilies and the garyulies and the grand panjandrum himself with the little round button on top. And they all <laughs> fell to playing the game of catch as catch can till the gunpowder ran out at the heels of their boots. <laughs> and this is what Samuel Foote challenged Macklin to remember. Total rubbish. <laughs> I'm going to get myself all nonsense verse books now. You do that, Ogden Nash, Edward Lear, Lewis Carroll, and of course Samuel Foote. And that's our show for today. Thank you so much for being here and see you again next Wednesday. <laughs>